I would invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 28. And as we consider the reality of the resurrection this morning, I want to draw our attention to the actual event uh, and some of the surrounding events as recorded in Scripture. We talk a lot about the cross and the centrality of the cross in this church, and for very good reason. The cross of Christ, as you know, was that great act of atonement. That is to say that it was that place for which the wrath of God was poured out on Christ, but in the place of the sinner. And so the cross is, is critical. Without the cross, we have nothing. Without the cross of Christ, there is no forgiveness of sin. God can't just overlook sin, not if he's to be just. And so the cross was absolutely necessary. It is where God dealt with our sin, but in a substitutionary sort of way. Again, Christ took upon himself that full judicial wrath that was deserved for the sinner. And so we understand the centrality of, of what he accomplished at Calvary. And yet what is essential to understand, and this is the point for today, but the offering of Christ would mean nothing if there was not also a resurrection of the body. Without the resurrection of Christ, then Jesus has just died in vain, and we are all still dead in our sins, as Paul writes. If Christ was not raised from the dead, then what is the point of any of this? Sin has not been forgiven, and death has not been defeated. And so while the cross is critical, what is essential, and again, this is why we gather this morning, but what is essential is that that tomb then, on that very first Easter morning, actually be empty, right? It's got to be empty. And what is significant to understand is that it was empty, historically. In fact, that is actually just a historical fact. There is ample evidence and record of this, not merely in the Gospels, but also in secular Jewish and Roman history. And so the fact that there was an empty tomb where the body of this man named Jesus was laid, that, that is not a debate, understand, in secular scholarship. There was a historical Jesus. He was actually executed under Roman law. He was factually buried in a garden tomb that belonged to a rich man named Joseph of Arimathea. And then several days later, the tomb was historically and factually empty. There's just no debate about those facts. That, that is not where the conversation is at. Rather, the conversation for the past 2,000 years has been, so how did that tomb get empty? That is the question. And so it's essential to the Christian faith that the tomb be empty. We know this. Again, historically it was. But what is even more critical to the Christian faith is that it be empty, but how? Well, through a true resurrection. This is the issue. And so what I want to do this morning is just look at the historical record of this empty tomb according to the historical record of Matthew's writing, and specifically in chapter 28 and verses 11 through 15. Now, this is not going to be a normal sermon, sort of verse by verse like we normally do, uh, but I want to take a look at these verses in particular because this is a record of the reaction of the religious leadership at the report of a missing body. It is a fascinating account that I wish we had the time to dissect in a more careful way. And it is an ironic passage here that records the lie of the religious leadership. And it's, it's ironic because in this lie to cover up the truth of what actually happened, they actually just end up proving the very opposite of the lie that they intended to use as a cover-up. And so you might actually entitle this passage here, The Gospel According to Jesus' Enemies. And because in their attempt to deceive, they just end up bearing witness to the veracity of a true resurrection. And so I want to look at this passage with you this morning. And again, this is verses 11 through 15 of Matthew chapter 28. And let me actually just begin here by setting up the scene a little bit with some of the context in verses 1 through 10 in which we have, first of all, the record here of an empty tomb. So we're going to see what I'm just going to call an empty tale in verses 11 through 15. But we have here, first of all, an empty tomb. And so notice verse 1. Notice what this writer says. Matthew states these words. He says, Now after the Sabbath, 
As it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Now, most of you know the story. Jesus, he's arrested on Thursday. He is tried and then crucified on Friday. Uh, since the Jews observe the Sabbath, which is Saturday, they want him dead and buried before the Sabbath comes. And so before the Sabbath arrives, which actually begins late Friday evening at about sunset, they take down his body, they do some quick preparation of the body, and then they place the body into the tomb. Now in verses 62 through 64 of chapter 27, just look back there, 62 through 64 of chapter 27, notice what Matthew records here. He says in verse 62, now on the next day, so this would now be the Sabbath or Saturday, the crucifixion is done, but on the next day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate, and they said, sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I am to rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead, and the last deception, meaning the lie of the resurrection, will be worse than the first, meaning the stir that he created when he talked about destroying the temple during Passion Week. And so for fear of the disciples stealing the body, they request here of the Roman government to make certain that this body is preserved, that it's, it's kept in the tomb until those three days have passed. And then in verse 65, Matthew says this. Notice he says, So Pilate said to them, You have a guard, so go and make it as secure as you know how. And so they went and made the grave secure and along with the guard, and they set a seal on the stone. Now, this was probably some kind of wax seal that would stretch from the exterior of the tomb and reach over to the stone that rolled over the covering. And that would be to communicate that these people would do well to keep their distance and because it would be a symbol that this tomb is under Roman protection. It's under Roman authority. And so there would be here, no doubt, a very heavy presence of military guard. And in fact, we know that there were many guards because of chapter 28 and verses 11 through 12, which we'll look at in a moment. And so this is, understand, far more than just a couple of off-duty, unarmed security guards. In fact, remember, the goal of, of Rome was to keep what was called the Pax Romana, uh, that is, the peace of Rome, and understand that it was, it was a very heavy-handed peace. They, they, they didn't care all that much about these intra-Jewish squabbles, uh, this religious infighting of the Jews. Rather, they were just interested in keeping the peace. And again, it was a very heavy-handed kind of peace. The Pax Romana was a force that would just immediately squash any kind of uprising any type of revolt. In fact, as you know, the Jews were notoriously known for their uprisings and their revolts. And so in order to keep the peace, Pilate here probably would have been very willing to set his seal and give these Jewish leaders these guards that they had desired. In fact, that is actually the cause for why he allowed them to trade in Jesus for Barabbas in the first place. Remember, the crowd there was getting large, it was getting hostile, and so he wanted to put an end to that before it started to get too out of control or too violent. Uh, and so he would often choose diplomacy over violence. Now, he was not a man who cared at all, obviously, about justice, but his concern was with maintaining order. In fact, he even himself found no crime in Jesus. We know that from his own words. And yet he was still very willing to trade out a notorious criminal for Jesus, if that is what would satiate this crowd. And so the fact that Jesus here had the popularity that he did, remember he entered Passion Week with celebrity status, all of Jerusalem was hailing his praises potentially as the Messiah. He was a veritable celebrity. And so this tomb, understand, would have been heavily guarded. This would have been virtually impenetrable. This is the point. Jesus was a very major deal, and so Pilate would have known the potential for this to get out of control very quickly if Jesus' body all of a sudden went missing. And so Matthew says that he gives here these Judaistic leaders that which they're requesting. Again, this is petty Jewish infighting, and so he has no stake in this. 
And so he gives them a fleet of guards, he gives to them a Roman seal, and whatever else it is here that they're wanting, but in order to secure this tomb. And so in chapter 28, then, we see now the two Marys who come to the tomb. Verse 1, Mark tells us that they brought some spices. Again, his body would have been prepared in some haste. They wanted it down and in before uh, the Sabbath had appeared. Um, and perhaps they're bringing some spices here to the tomb just as a symbolic act of care. They usually bury their corpses with about 75 pounds of spices. And so this is, this is what they do. And so what happens then when they arrive? Well, notice now verse 2. Verse 2 states this. It says, And an angel showed up, sat on top of this rolled-away stone. And what does that do? Well, it sends these women into great fear. Verse 5 Matthew records that the appearance of this angel is described to be something like lightning. His garments are white as snow. Uh, the guards, of course, see all of this. And so what happens to them? Well, they fall down as dead men, as Matthew records. And so the description of this angel appearing is consistent with all other appearances of angels in the scriptures. And that is that when angels show up, people just start falling over like they're dead. These are unbelievably terrifying creatures. These are imperial type of beings. These are military type of creatures. They are majestic. They're dignified. They're holy. And so these guards, of course, fall over and probably here from some type of shock or hyperventilation. In fact, the term here for shook, it's the same root word in the original as the term here for earthquake. And so as one man commented on this, he said, the tremors of the earthquake cease, but the tremors within the guards do not. And so they quake here in both mind and then body and then fall over in fear, probably from some type of paralysis. Now, these poor women here probably have not slept since about Wednesday. And so they might not be believing their own eyes on some of this, but this would have been, this would have been bizarre. This would have been an extremely frightening scene. And so in verse 5, Matthew says this, notice he says, And the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. Now, Matthew here again, notice he says that the angel answered, and yet notice neither one of these women actually ask a question, right? And so sometimes no questions are asked, but sometimes answers still need to be given. And so he knows exactly what they are here for. And then notice as well, Matthew is very careful to include this final phrase here of the angel, where notice he acknowledges that Jesus was genuinely crucified. That, that is to say that he gives divine testimony to the fact that Jesus has been definitively executed. Angels function as God's messengers, and so what they say is, in a sense, that which God himself is saying. And so this is divine testimony to the death of Jesus. And so in verse 6, he then says this. He says, he is not here, for he has risen, and just as he said. And so what we have here in the words of this angel is actually the very first proclamation of the full gospel message. What we have here in the words of the angel is Jesus Christ both crucified, but also risen. First time that this message is preached. And so he says to the women of verse 6, So come and see the place where he was laying. Now, what is, what is the point of the angel here coming and rolling back this stone? Well, it isn't so that he might let Jesus out. That is a great misconception. You hear people say that all the time. Rather, what is the reason he rolls back the stone? Well, notice it is so that he might let these women in. That is to say, Jesus didn't need any help on this. He is the sovereign God of the universe, and by whom all things are being held together. If Jesus wants out, he's going to get out. He is not bound by some rock whose elements are being held together by the very word of his own permissive sovereign will. And so you ask, well, how could he get out with a physical body? Well, the same way he got into that locked house in John chapter 20. He just walks through things. He is in every sense of the term, a physical person in the incarnation, and yet at the same time, the glorified body or the resurrected state is far more than just mere physicality. It is not less than physical, but it is far more than physical. 
And so the purpose of the angel rolling back the stone here was to let these women in, but to see with their own eyes an empty tomb. And so by both word and vision in this scene, these women are preached the resurrection of Christ. And so we have an empty tomb. This is now Sunday morning, very early. Now, again, the, the reality of, of an empty tomb, it's just a historical fact. There's just way too much independently corroborated evidence to deny the historicity of an empty tomb. And so, again, the question is not, was there an empty tomb? Rather, the question in any serious historian's mind is, but how did the tomb get empty? That is the question. That has always been the question. In fact, to not know that that is the question is to be ignorant of the discussion. And so let me just say here that there have always been explanations then and various theories put forth by those who would deny a physical or bodily resurrection of Christ from the dead. And because, again, they have to give an answer for an empty tomb, and so all kinds of theories have been proffered. In fact, let me just offer some of them to you. But first of all, there was something called, for example, the swoon theory. You've probably heard of some of these before, but the first one is the swoon theory, S-W-O-O-N. This is the theory that Jesus didn't actually die in a medical sense, like the angel testified that he did. Rather, he just went into some kind of semi-coma or went unconscious or he swooned. And he went unconscious, obviously, from the trauma of his beatings and the cross. And so due to the cool and damp temperatures of the tomb, they say, and then mixed with the stimulation of burial spices, 75 pounds of them, all of that together somehow brought him out of this coma. He was then able to unwrap his own burial cloths from the inside, which if you know how these people were wrapped in this day, that would be a miracle in and of itself. But then he was also somehow able to escape from the inside of this pitch black tomb. Now, if Jesus was just a mere man, which, of course, these theory, theories posit that he was, and he rolled away, then how he rolled away the stone from the inside by himself, and that in light of having just undergone the physical torment and blood loss of Roman torture and crucifixion, that, that is something that is left to be answered by those who hold this position. How in the world he got out? That is something for them to discern. Not to mention, they'll also need to explain how he did all of that without any of the guards noticing. But the theory itself states that after he somehow did all this, he then appeared to his disciples some days later. And so the disciples' only conclusion then at that point was that this must have been a true resurrection. Now, those who hold to this position, they will struggle to answer on top of many other things as to how Jesus possibly could have walked seven miles down the road to Emmaus on feet that just had nails shoved through them, but this is the theory. This was a narrative that was developed in the 1700s by the German rationalists, whose worldview, of course, presupposes that a resurrection from the dead is impossible. This, again, was an attempt to deal with the historical fact that the tomb of the historical Jesus was factually empty, and because, again, that is the issue to reckon with. Now, we could say a lot more on each one of these, but let me just keep moving. A second theory, then, is what came to be known as the hallucination theory. The hallucination theory. This is the idea that everyone who claimed to have seen the resurrected Jesus simply experienced a hallucination. Now, the problem with this theory is that not only did the disciples not actually expect a resurrection, and because... This position also posits that there was a collective hallucination that was induced in some way by a zealous expectation of a resurrection. But not only did the disciples not actually expect a resurrection, if you just read the Gospels, but even some of Jesus' own followers doubted what they were experiencing at his appearing. Think of the man that we've all come to call, for example, as Doubting Thomas in John chapter 20. Resurrection was just not actually an expectation in their minds. And then beyond even that, there were actually many independent claims of people seeing the resurrected Christ. And so the question then becomes, so how did all of these people, and for whom there were over 500, by the way, we know this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
and many of them independent of one another, but how did all these people come to hallucinate about the exact same thing and for which there was no actual expectation? And so the great hole in this theory is that First of all, it assumes that there was an actual expectation of a resurrection by the followers of Jesus, but most importantly, it doesn't account again for an empty tomb. That is to say that even if some type of collective hallucination could be proven, how does that explain anything about an empty tomb? And so this is a naturalistic explanation for the claims of a resurrection. It's, it's gained some traction again in our modern psychological world, but it is a position that leaves just too much to be desired, and of course with too many historical problems, and again, it doesn't offer anything in terms of dealing with an empty tomb. And then a third theory is what is known as the no-burial theory. The no-burial theory, this is the idea that since it is a historical fact that the tomb of the historical Jesus was factually empty on this Sunday morning, then the only reasonable explanation is that Jesus then was just never actually put into it. And so that is their solution. He was just never actually placed in this tomb. And so instead, they say, his body was just discarded into a mass grave for criminals, which was actually the practice in many cases of Roman custom. But again, this just has too many historical problems. Not only did many witness the preparation of the body and the placing of it into the tomb, but why would Rome, and think about this, but why would Rome then bother to establish guards to secure and then seal the tomb if there was no body in it? Makes no sense. In fact, more than that, why would these Jewish leaders request such guards for fear of a body being stolen. If it was just thrown into a massive grave that everybody would have witnessed, then end of story. And you better believe that they would have followed this body based upon their concerns in Matthew chapter 27. And so again, just too many historical issues. Another closely associated theory is the wrong tomb theory. The wrong tomb theory, where some will conclude that the most reasonable explanation for a missing body is simply due to the fact that disciples showed up to the wrong tomb. They really didn't know where it was. They maybe just forgot where it was because they were so overwhelmed with grief and loss. But again, far too many problems. And then a fifth theory is the impersonation theory, sometimes called the mistaken identity theory. The impersonation theory or mistaken identity theory. This is the view that the appearances of Jesus were not actually Jesus at all. Rather, they were just someone who was impersonating Jesus. This is proven, they argue, in the fact that many of the disciples didn't immediately recognize Jesus at his appearing. And so they argue that the disciples just so badly desired to see Jesus again that they believed this impersonator. And so out of this, of course, came some type of fable about a true resurrection. Now, while that might be persuasive to some people, the problem still remains that the theory explains absolutely nothing about an empty tomb. And so it is a solution, perhaps, but it is a solution to the wrong problem. And then a sixth theory is the telepathy theory. The telepathy theory. Now, here you get into some of the more supernatural explanations for the claim of a resurrection. These are what you might call pre-modern or uh, perhaps now post-modern theories. These are less concerned with a scientific or historically plausible evidentiary argument. They just don't like the fact that Jesus might have actually been raised and because of what it might now mean for them. And so they're just going to try and explain away somehow how the disciples of Jesus actually believed in a resurrection of the body. And so this theory, the, the telepathy theory, is a supernatural explanation that says that God simply sent telepathic messages to Christians that caused them to believe that Jesus was actually alive. In other words, God is sending to them mental pictures. Now, first of all, not only would that make God a liar and a deceiver, which, of course, is contrary to his nature, and, of course, make all the disciples and the apostles liars, which is contrary to the ethics of their own message, but it doesn't account for the fact that many of the disciples didn't immediately recognize Jesus as Jesus. And so it was a blurry Jesus, or as one man said, God must have been using old antennas. But beyond even that, it doesn't account for the claims that this risen Jesus was able to be touched. 
doesn't account for the fact that he was able to eat. It doesn't account for the fact that he made his disciples breakfast. How did he do all of that if this was just a mental thing? But again, most importantly, while it might attempt to explain how the followers of Jesus came to actually believe in some kind of resurrection, it still doesn't account for an empty tomb. And so again, whatever your position, this is the issue that demands to be answered. And then maybe just, just one more. The seventh, a seventh theory, there are others, but a seventh theory is the seance theory. The seance theory, this theory suggests that a powerful spiritualist or some kind of medium conjured up the image of Jesus by means of some type of occult power. And so again, this is another supernatural explanation for the claims of a resurrection. But again, it suffers majorly from the fact that those who claim to see a resurrected Jesus also made claim to his physicality. That is to say, again, that he could be touched. He could eat. There was a physical body. Seances deal strictly with the ephemeral. They deal with the non-spiritual, non-material type of world. And so the fact that Jesus appeared physically undermines this position. Now, again, there are others, but you get the idea. Some of these, frankly, are more ridiculous than actually just having to believe in an actual resurrection. But the great problem with every single one of these theories is that, again, they all fail to account for the historicity of an empty tomb. And so, again, you have to deal with the historical fact. There, there was a historical Jesus, and the very same tomb in which he was laid was empty. And so very few people believe in these theories anymore. There are just too many historical problems, evidential problems, worldview problems. And so they've, they've pretty well fallen out of popularity in many ways. And so what is the best explanation then these days for the fact of an empty tomb? Well, the best explanation at this point is what has come to be called the theft theory. The theft theory. And this really is the best rational or non-supernatural explanation for an empty tomb. This has been the most popular position, by the way, all throughout the ages, and it is a theory that you need to go with at this point if you're gonna be historically honest, but at the same time deny a resurrection. And so again, many theories have been offered throughout the ages, but this is the one that many who deny the resurrection just keep going back to. Now, there are several versions of this and there are new twists on it that come out every now and then. It, but it's basically the idea, as the title says, that the body of Jesus was stolen. Now, again, this one suffers as well from many problems, which, by the way, is why people have felt the need over the years to come out with different theories to explain some of this stuff. But it is probably the best explanation, and because it does account for the historical dilemma, which is the fact that there was historically an empty Tomb. In fact, if you want to read a somewhat modern example of this theory with its own little twist, uh, look up something called the Passover Plot. Passover Plot, it was, was a work that came out by a British scholar back in the 60s. It's pretty creative, a little beyond ridiculous, somewhat humorous to read about, but it's just more evidence that shows how people are hoping to come up with something that will allow people to be able to deny the obvious. But whatever the case, the theft theory is the prevailing view. It is probably, again, the best rational explanation for an empty tomb. And what is important to understand is that the theft theory is something that actually goes all the way back to the resurrection itself. In fact, notice now, if you would, verses 11 through 15. The idea of Jesus' body being stolen, this is the very lie that was conjured up by the Jewish leaders themselves. And in fact, since it is probably the best explanation, then no doubt that Satan then was in on it and pushing it right here from the beginning in Matthew chapter 28. And so in verse 11, Matthew says this, notice. He says, now while they, that is the women, were on their way to Galilee, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that happened. So evidently some of the guard were still knocked out or maybe just hanging back to keep watch over the area of the tomb. But whatever the case, not all of them come, as Matthew says, just some of them come, and which, by the way, just goes to show again that there were far more than just one or two guards here. Again, it would have been a heavily guarded area. 
But Matthew says that they came to the chief priests and reported all, keyword, but reported all that had happened. Now, you know exactly what to ask at this point, right? How much is all? Well, all means all. So this would have been a report that included earthquakes, which, by the way, is on historical record. This report would have included angels, would have included a stone being rolled back, bright white lights, empty wrappings, a missing body. These guards know exactly what happened. Now, they were knocked out, so perhaps they thought they were just dreaming, but they nevertheless report here all of the facts as witnessed by them, and especially what the scene would have looked like when they came to, right? And so what did they witness? Well, at the very least, and most importantly, an empty tomb. And so what is the immediate response of the leaders? Verse 12, and when they assembled with the elders and counseled together or conspired is the term, what did they do? Well, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. And they said, you are to say, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over or pay him off and keep you out of trouble. And so what do they do? Well, they do exactly what you would expect a bunch of corrupt politicians to do. And so what do they offer? Well, notice they offer three things. They offer, first of all, a large sum of money. They offer, second of all, a tale or a lie. And then they offer, third of all, some protection. So money, a tale, and protection. And so again, nothing new under the sun. Politicians just doing what politicians do, but in an attempt always to preserve their own power. Now, the lie here is obviously an empty one. There is no evidence at all of a stolen body. And so first of all, it's, again, somewhat ironic that they just end up committing here the very thing that they were afraid of back in chapter 27, which is that they were afraid of the follower of Jesus concocting some type of lie. After, notice, they label Jesus a deceiver, verse 63. In fact, notice uh, the leadership here at the report of these soldiers, they ask how many questions? None. Zero questions asked. They don't probe at all to see what these things might mean. Rather, their only response and natural response is to go to an immediate cover-up. They are not interested at all in truth. They are not interested in facts. Rather, they're interested only, notice, in the propagation of their own position. It's like people who don't want God to exist. What do they do? Well, they immediately go to the internet and start Googling arguments for why God doesn't exist. They don't ask for arguments on how God does exist, but how he doesn't. And so they're not at all interested actually in undergoing an honest investigation of the truth. There is no honest desire to discover the truth. Rather, they're just predisposed to believe that which they desire to believe. And so what do they do? Well, they try and marshal a bunch of evidence that will se seem to agree with that which they're already wanting to be true. Confirm their own bias. Now, these leaders here are people who for three years have heard the teachings of Jesus. Chapter 27, of verse 63, again, their great fear is the fact that Jesus time and time again declared that he would rise in three days. And so they know exactly what this was, and yet what is the issue? Well, the issue here is some unbelievably, hear this, it is some unbelievably hardened hearts. That is the issue. They saw his miracles time and time again. In fact, we've been seeing that all throughout the Gospel of Luke. These leaders have been dogging his steps every step of the way, but in an effort to try and trap him in something. They heard his teachings over and over again. They were careful observers of his claims. Obviously, again, verse 63 of chapter 27. And yet at the testimony of the guards, who, by the way, have, again, zero stake at all, in this intra-Jewish issue, and who would therefore have no reason to lie, but the only instinct of the Jewish leadership here is to devise a cover-up. 
And so again, why? Why is that the case? Well, because no matter the evidence or the testimony, hear this, no matter the evidence, they don't want it. That is the issue. They don't want it. In fact, the term here to conspire, it's, it's used four separate times in Matthew's gospel, and every single one of them in reference to a formal council in which a decision or a plot is agreed upon. And so what you have here actually is a formal meeting of the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling body of the Jewish Judaistic system. And so they come here to a three-point resolution in which they'll offer a bribe, a lie, and some protection. And so why? Why is that the case? Here it is. It is because they stand as representative figures in this gospel of those who hate truth. They hate the truth. That is to say, these are those who have heard the truth, but what are they loving? Falsehood. Darkness. And because, again, there is so much testimony, so much evidence, so much witness as to who Jesus was, and much of it by their own eyes. And yet, what do they do? Deny, 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 reject. They will not bow to this man. And again, if you've been with us in Luke, we have been seeing this over and over again, but they hate Jesus. And why? Well, in this case, it is because he threatens their power. This man has been stealing the religious spotlight. He has been garnering way too much attention, way too much loyalty. And so they hate him. They despise this, this man. And why? Ultimately, because of their own pride. It is because of pride. And so despite the evidence, they will not believe. All they can do is immediately go to conspiring a plot to cover up the obvious. Deny and suppress. In fact, this is why I say actually time and time again that you cannot reason a person into saving faith, right? Can't marshal enough evidence. You cannot provide enough rational argumentation that'll somehow change the mind and why? Well, because it is never an issue of the mind, is it? It is never an issue of the mind. Rather, it is always an issue of the heart. Belief in Christ has very little to do with evidence and everything to do with what the heart is loving. And so either you're a lover of the truth, and that the evidence will support, by the way, but either you're a lover of the truth or you are a hater of it. Why? Because you are a lover of self. And so you conspire a way to deny and suppress. And if you're a hater of it, and the reason that you're a hater of it is because the message of Christ, now hear this, but the message of Christ threatens your own pride. Just like these leaders. Threatens our desire to want to live as autonomous creatures who can do whatever we want, when we want, how we want. This is my life. And so we will not bow. And so what, what is that? Well, that is, that is just the state of this world. That is the natural bent. That has always been the state of the world. I don't want God encroaching on my life. And so it's just pride. It's like little children who play the game. If I can't see you, then you can't see me. I just pretend God isn't then I can just do me. People might mask it at times under some intellectual argument, but none of the arguments are all that impressive. In fact, most people who come up with whatever concocted argument to deny God or deny, to deny Christ the reality in the depth of their own heart as they know it to be true, they don't actually believe it. They're just wanting an excuse to not have to bow. This is convenient. 
fact, it's why Jesus says of the leaders in Luke chapter 16 and verse 31, he says these words, he says, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, which is just a Jewish way of saying the scriptures, but if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, hear that term, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises even from the dead. And so here in Matthew chapter 28, he just proves that very claim. If people don't have ears and a heart to want to know the truth, if they don't have a heart to want to love the truth, if they don't have a heart to want to bend their life toward the beauty of the truth, then not even the best arguments and evidences will cause them to do that. They could even witness a resurrection from the dead with their very own eyes, and they'll still find a reason not to believe it. It is the irrational absurdity of, of pride. It, it blinds people to the truth. In fact, verse 15, notice, Matthew says, and so they took the money and they did as had been instructed. And this theory or this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. Now, Matthew is writing about 30 years after the resurrection. So this is about 63 to 65 AD. In fact, this was such a good cover-up that even in Justin Martyr's famous writings in his dialogue with Trypho, he reports that this story was still present even in the second century. And of course, that lie has just continued all the way down to this present hour. But the question here is, why does Matthew include this? Why does he talk about this? plot to cover up the resurrection. Well, again, he, he is writing to Christians. And so as he comes to the great climax of his gospel where he testifies of the resurrection, he gives the account of this empty tale. Why? Well, to function now as validation as to the veracity of a resurrection. That is to say that it stands as a convincing apologetic for the Christian, but to affirm the truthfulness of the resurrection. And so you ask, well, how does this validate the truthfulness of the resurrection? Well, again, because we have to do something with an empty tomb, right? And the only theory that can account for an empty tomb is the theft theory. But the great problem with the theft theory, now hear this, but the great problem with the theft theory is that it utterly fails to come up with a body. That was never an accounting for the body. And you say, well, yeah, that's because it was stolen. Well, first of all, those claiming a stolen body bear the burden of proof to prove that it was actually stolen, or at the very least, circumstantially prove it. If you can't come up with a body to prove it was stolen, then at least make a case evidentially for how it could have been stolen, which of course they can't and never could. But second of all, there are just way too many issues here to believe in a stolen body. In fact, let me just state a few of them for you very quickly. First of all, you have the great issue here of the guards themselves. This is a problem. Roman soldiers were ordered to protect and to guard, but under a threat of their own life. In fact, there's been a lot that's been written on this, but there'd be a serious penalty up to and including even the demand for their own life for something like this. And so there's just no way that anybody's going to reasonably believe that these guards would have been so casual about this. In fact, the Roman military divided the night into four separate watches running about two to three hours each. And so they'd rotate sleeping while others stood guard. And so this is a far stretch for anybody who knows anything about Roman practice to believe that the body was stolen from under their watch. Second of all, if they were asleep, then it's also going to be a hard sell to believe that a group of ragtag men and women are going to be able to come up, break the seal, roll away a massive stone from the grave, pull out a body, and then run away with it, and yet somehow do all of that with somehow not making a single noise. I mean, if you want to make the argument that the guards were asleep, then no reasonable person is going to believe that that was pulled off somehow without at least one guard waking up. 
And then if they did wake up to see this, then who's going to believe that military men wouldn't be able to catch up to a group of clumsy men and women who've got a body that they're dragging around? Some people say, well, yeah, maybe they paid off the guards. Maybe the disciples paid off the guards. All right, but with what? They had no money. Jesus himself was homeless. The Sanhedrin, who had very deep pockets, even they had to cough up, notice, a large sum of money. And in fact, it had to be large and, and because it had to be worth it. And because, again, these soldiers risked their own life in the losing of this, this body, so, so that doesn't work either. And then third of all, and most importantly, you have a problem as well with the lie itself. If the guards were actually asleep, and the tale, as the tale here claims, then how in the world would they actually know what happened? That is to say, how could their testimony be credible that the body was stolen by the disciples if they were asleep through the whole thing? How do they know? And so it's a ridiculous premise. And so you have, first of all, a problem here with the guards. But then, second of all, this lie also fails to make a case in terms of producing a reasonable motive. That is to say, why would the disciples even feel the need to do this in the first place? It completely ignores their own mental state. First of all, the Jesus movement at this point in Jerusalem is now dead. The entire nation has turned on Jesus. They've cried out for his blood. The energy is gone, the momentum is gone, hope is gone. And so what at this point would they actually be fighting for? This man has been crucified. Nobody is going to follow him at this point as the political Messiah. He's just been murdered in part by Rome, the very entity whom the Jews are hoping the Messiah is going to lead the charge to overthrow. And so in being arrested and beaten and crucified by Rome, he's just lost all credibility of being the Messiah, who again, in their view, is to be a political or military leader who's going to overthrow this occupying force. And so first of all, the movement itself is dead. But then second of all, as we've already mentioned, there was no actual expectation in the mind of the disciples as to a resurrection in the first place. In fact, time and time again, toward the very end of the gospel records, you have the disciples still doubting even when Jesus appears. Now, there was some talk of a resurrection before his death, but they never really understood what any of that meant. And then even if they could create a resurrection hoax, what would that actually accomplish? You couldn't present a living Jesus so who are these people going to follow? But beyond even that, it fails to explain the motive in the sense of where did these followers all of a sudden get the courage to sneak in under the nose of some Roman guards, risk rolling away a stone with no noise, and then stealing a body under threat of their own life? Just three days earlier, Peter, the great leader of these disciples, denied Christ three times, and one of whom was to a little girl. He didn't have the courage to associate himself with Jesus to a little girl, then why the courage to steal a body under the nose of Rome? And so again, a very difficult line of reasoning. These disciples were shattered after the crucifixion. They were just trying to process. They're, they're still trying to put the pieces together. What in the world has, has just happened? Our floor has just dropped out from under us. They probably felt great shame for believing all the lies of this deceiver for three years. Just for this whole thing to come to a screeching halt within a matter of days and to end in his own execution, these disciples would have felt like fools. They would have been angry, they would have been sad, they, they would have been utterly disoriented and confused, no doubt. And so there's just no way that these disciples would have been able to hatch together such a foolproof plan within basically the matter time of a day. And so you have here the problem of producing and proving the disciples' motive. And then third, you still have the problem of the missing body. In the first place, if this story of the stolen body was true, the Jewish leaders definitely could have found this body with very little difficulty. 
They had the resources of hundreds of men, including military men, and they even had, of course, the backing of Rome itself. And so they would have had a body very quickly, and especially, again, if the body was stolen from under the nose of Rome, they would have been involved. And so as one man commented, if he wanted to disprove the resurrection, then the simplest way to have done it would have been to just locate the body and then put it on display. And yet notice there is absolutely zero evidence that the Sanhedrin ever even attempted to find a body. What did they do? They just paid everybody off to be quiet immediately. But then more than that, in, in the claim that the disciples stole it, why wouldn't they have just gone after the disciples? Again, very easy to do since they had the backing of Rome. And so the failure of the Sanhedrin to even begin such a search, th this is some strong evidence, again, as one man said, that they themselves actually believed to whatever degree that possibly Jesus had actually risen from the dead. Again, these people saw his miracles for three years. They knew exactly what this man was capable of. And so this was not an issue of intellect. Again, this was an issue of absolute hatred. Motivated by self-preservation and the maintaining of their own authority. I mean, if they really believed that Jesus wasn't raised and the body was actually stolen, it would have been, again, so easy to just send out a search party until somebody came up with some kind of body. And so the problem with this lie is that it fails to account for the guards, it fails to account for the motive of the disciples, and it fails to account for a missing body. And there are other problems that we could look at, but there are just way too many things that happened when, or didn't happen for anybody here closely involved with this to somehow believe that this body was genuinely stolen. And yet this is the exact tale that was told, and that is the exact empty tale that was believed even to the time of Matthew's writing and beyond. And so Matthew is very careful to include here the hoax of a stolen body, but actually as evidence toward the veracity of a resurrection. And because anything else is rationally and historically ridiculous. This is the gospel according to Jesus' own enemies. If your own enemies, namely the Roman soldiers here, the Jewish elites, testify as to what has actually happened, because some of them are actually here, that is, these guards, and then they need to engage in a cover-up because they hate the implications of a resurrection, then Matthew includes it because it communicates that that's some pretty good reason then to believe. This is testimony by the enemies of Jesus that Jesus was actually raised from the dead. Well, there is much more that we could say on these things, but, but the bottom line is we still have an empty tomb, historically. And then second of all, there is absolutely no reasonable evidence for a stolen body. And so until we can prove otherwise, then the most reasonable conclusion is what? Well, that Jesus was actually raised physically and bodily from the dead just as he said he would be. And if you deny that, then the onus is on you to come up with a theory that explains the historical fact of an empty tomb. Because again, you have to do something with an empty tomb. This is a historical reality. No serious historian or scholar debates that. We have an empty tomb. And so the question for us in this morning is what do we do with it? That is the ultimate question. Question, is there meaning in an empty tomb? Well, as Christians who know and believe that it is due to a true resurrection of Jesus from the dead, let me just give you five very quick statements, very quick. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher of the 18th century, reflecting on these verses, he said this. Here's what an empty tomb should cause us to reflect upon this morning. He said, first of all, that the empty tomb ought to move us to consider, first of all, the condescension of God the condescension of God. That is to say that in the coming to earth, not only to the infinite God and creator of the universe, who upholds all things by the very word of his power, not only did he take on flesh, but he even took it on to the point of death. And even the most shameful kind of death, which was death on a cross. 
The king deserved nothing but honor, and yet he took on insult and shame and was stripped naked, but to hang in the place of the sinner. And so we ought to reflect, first of all, on the condescension of God himself. But then second of all, an empty tomb should move us to consider the horror of our own sin. The horror of our own sin. For again, the just payment of sin is death. And Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so what is the result? Well, that every single one of us are owed the just payment of our own sin, which is death. We tend to think lightly or tritely of our sin, but sin is the cause of every moment of pain, every experience of suffering in this world. Why are things so broken? Why do so many things in life just seem to fail? Why do so few things ever just seem to work out? Why is there sadness? Why is there sickness? Why is there deep disappointment? Why do people betray us? Why is there death? There is just a horror to sin, and every subsequent horror or effect of sin has its root in the great horror, which is sin itself. And there is a consequence of that horror, which is the horror of death. Third of all, the empty tomb then ought to lead us to a reminder then of our own mortality. It ought to remind us of our own mortality. It is an easy thing to assume that tomorrow has actually been promised to us, right? But tomorrow has not been promised. This afternoon has not been promised. You have no idea what awaits for you as you enter back into your car. Every single one of us just assumes that we're going to get home, and we assume that a lot, don't we? But the reality of your life and mine is that every single one of us are hurling toward that final hour in which we will promise we will breathe our last breath. We are on a very limited time clock, and these days just keep ticking by so fast. But there is a day coming in which all of us will stand before our maker and creator and give an account. Paul says that in that day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, and we will absolutely confess him for who he is. But the problem is that that confession in that day will be a confession that is far too late if you do not make that confession now in this great hour of grace. And so as we consider the empty tomb this morning, we would be wise to let it also remind us of our own mortality. But then fourth, Spurgeon says that the empty tomb ought to move us to consider the fact that the tomb is empty. And because Jesus said it would be, time and time again. And so again, I say to you, you've got to do something with the fact of an empty tomb. And for the Christian, the emptiness of the tomb means for you the fullness of life. For in the resurrection of Christ, both sin and death have been defeated. The resurrection of Christ vindicates the very claims of Jesus himself to be God. And so that the tomb was empty, we have reason to hope. And then fifth and finally, Spurgeon also says, so because the tomb is empty and Jesus rose from the grave, here is the hope, you too shall rise. You too shall rise. And that is our great hope this morning, right? That's why we're here, that's why we sing. For as Jesus said in John chapter 11 and verse 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And so he who believes or trusts in me, he will live even if he dies. And so just hours before his rest, he comforts again his disciples with these words. He says, and after a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. 
And because I live, you shall live also. Death is the bitter payment for sin, and all of us have sinned. But if we confess our sin and we confess Jesus as Lord, as Paul says, and believe in our hearts that Jesus or that God truly rose him from the grave, then you shall be saved. And none of the disappointments of this world will have mattered. This life is just a dot on the very long line called eternity. And so if you've not done so this morning, then I would urge you, while you still have breath in your lungs, to first of all, know your sin. Know the guilt that you possess before a holy and righteous God. But then know as well the hope that you can have in the resurrection of the body from the dead. The hope that you can have in the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And so what is the call? The call here this morning is so come to him and bow the knee in love. And know for the very first time perhaps in your life a true hope true joy that cannot disappoint. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone. Christ crucified and risen. That is our hope. And let us sing of that great grace.